Uh, thanks, thanks, Matt, for that glowing introduction. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, thrilled to be here. Uh, Gert, Gert Kiss, uh, who many of you know, uh, uh, told me that uh, he was surprised that I looked so professional. And that made me feel great, because it made me feel like it was a um, very low bar today. So. <laughs> Uh, I, sh I, I need to start by uh, thanking the people uh, who did all the work. I, uh, <laughs> VJ told me that you know he uh, he found that managing at the venture fund and uh, managing at Stanford was a very very similar skill set. And, and internally, what was going on in my mind was like, yeah, if it was me, you'd be drinking coffee in one place or you'd be drinking coffee in another <laughs> place. <laughs> and, and that was your contribution. That's pretty much my contribution to uh, the work I'll tell you about. Uh, um, the, the, uh, the docking that I'll show you uh, was um, led by Henry Lin, a, a talented uh, graduate student now working at, uh, at Janssen, at J&J. Uh, Annette Levitt, um, has uh, picked up some of that project. Uh, Kate Stafford and, uh, and, and Nat's here. Here's a Nat. Uh, Kate Stafford and Magdalena Korzynska, uh, three super talented postdocs working on GPCR docking largely. Uh, some of the projects that, um, that Ryan introduced you to this morning. Uh, Matt, who you all know, uh, is uh, with uh, Josh Patel, uh, are uh, leading the uh, chemoinformatics that I'll, that I'll tell you about. None of it would be possible without John Irwin, uh, father of zinc and C and many other things. Um, and uh, for sure none of it would have been possible without our uh, experimental collaborators, uh, Brian Roth, uh, Brian Kabilka, and Peter Geminer. And uh, this is a, uh, Brian Roth is sort of like a ghost-like presence in this meeting. He's not here, but <laughs> feel his he's here he is about to uh, storm the castle with one of his uh, computational collaborators down there. Um, so this is uh, just, you know, this is what everyone in my field, I think I have a field, uh, 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 knows without even thinking about it, which is the, you know, the central dogma of information flow in, bi in biology, which is uh, information starts with DNA, goes to RNA, which uh, gets trans, uh, trans, uh, translated into, into proteins. And um, that leads to uh, particular proteins with particular sequences and particular folded forms. Um, you don't need to know the crystal structure of the beta-2 adrenergic receptor solved in Brian Kabilka's lab uh, uh, nine years ago now, ten years ago, uh, 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 to screen it. And a lot of empiric, we had a question about why not just do high throughput screening. That's a, a, a question I've been struggling with my, most of my career. Uh, uh, you just need to have an isolated receptor and then that leads, and then you can assay it and do screens for uh, ligand discovery. But uh, you can also go one step further and with the, the folded functional, the folded form determines the function of the protein and the small molecules it recognizes. And uh, based on, once you have, a, once you know the, the structure to atomic resolution, hopefully through ex an experimental structure, increasingly through um, comparative modeling, you can find a small molecule uh, that, that'll modulate it. And that's sort of like, that's, um, that's not just what docking and structure-based discovery is about, but that idea of going from targets to small molecules is all of molecular pharmacology and 95% of dis the discovery part of, of drug discovery. It's going from targets to ligands. And, and I'm going to come back. Uh, I, th I hope if I don't screw it up, most of the talk will be actually about flipping that idea on its head, going from ligands to targets, which was classical pharmacology. And well, we, here we're talking about it as chemoinformatics. But I did want to talk about the docking side of it because I, I, I realized there's a lot of interest in that and the uh, possible impacts uh, that um, unsupervised learning methods and uh, deep neural networks can have on that. And, and so I'd, I'd, I'd like to sketch some of the opportunities that, that we see in our, in our lab for the field. Um, you know, what it takes to make it work in terms of, of getting to real compounds that are that are tested for specific function and taking them forward, and and how you know how to how to get into that that field. So uh, you know a, a docking screen just to remind everybody starts with the structure of a protein, 
an atomic resolution structure of a protein, uh, a library of commercially available small molecules. Uh, Abe, in his talk, spoke about uh, the zinc library, what makes the zinc library, this is John's library, John Irwin's library, what makes it special is that it, it, it's uh, a library of molecules that you can purchase and get delivered to you in a few weeks, typically, um, from reputable vendors. Uh, so it's sort of the world's chemistry library. Uh, you don't have to store it yourself. You don't have to annotate it yourself. It's, it's just there for you. And, and their structures have been calculated. And this, this, the available part is, is important because it makes the, you know, uh, it makes the price of failure low. It's, it's, failure is cheap as long as you're sticking to available compounds because if the first one doesn't work, you go to the next one or the next 50, right? And, and that's much cheaper than convincing your, um, your, your close friend, the synthetic chemist, to make it for you. Because I can tell you from, from brutal experience, that's an, that's an experiment you usually run once. <laughs> <laughs> you know, three months later, it doesn't work. And, and, and there's a Fred Cohen joke about that, but uh, I'll save that for the end. Anyways, so uh, you, you take each of these molecules, you screen them against the structure, about 100,000 uh, different poses and conformations per molecule. So for a, 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 you know, a 10 million molecule library, maybe uh, 10 to the 12 complexes overall. And at the end of the day, you pick from the top ranking molecules uh, a handful, usually 20 to 50, that, that you want to test. And um, exactly which ones you should pick uh, um, is a, actually involves uh, some expert decisions. And I'll come back to that because I, I think uh, apart from making better scoring functions and, and so forth, this idea of exactly what to pick from what turns out to be a very big space, and as you'll see, uh, an uh, a space that's growing very rapidly, even at the very top of the list, uh, I think is an area where um, the methods that you guys are talking about today could really impact us. Um, I want to just sketch some areas where we've been able to make the method work and then tell you some of the reasons why the method should never work, right? Uh, so um, this is, uh, uh, Ryan uh, talked about um, this work on looking for novel agonists of the mu opioid receptor. He explained why we were doing that. We were looking for molecules that would activate the G protein downstream signaling pathway, specifically over the arrestin pathway with the, the G protein pathway is uh, associated with the, the things you want out of an opioid, analgesia. Whereas it just turns out in this case that the arrestin signaling pathway, which normal agonists will also activate, is associated with respiratory depression, uh, constipation, nausea, and, and, and perhaps tolerance. And so we were looking for molecules that would only activate the G protein pathway and not the arrestin pathway. And I won't dwell on it except to say we had no reason to believe that we could mechanically do that. Um, the one thing we could do, though, pragmatically uh, and, and plausibly is screen for molecules that looked very different from anything else that was known and then select those uh, with, you know, because we had a really tight collaboration with the Roth lab, select those few that had the properties we wanted. Look for novel compounds thinking they would do something interesting and new, not exactly sure what it was. Select the ones that, that were new in the right way. And, and that worked out. This was led by Ashish Manglik, who's in the front row here, uh, and Henry Lin in our lab, and uh, Dependra Arial in, in, uh, in the Roth lab. And, you know, we started with uh, a molecule that was, you know, actually mediocre in terms of affinity, um, you know, low micromolar affinity. Uh, and it was, you know, I think you saw these sorts of hit rates in Abe's talk. You know, uh, docking, I, sh I, I should say, docking cannot predict absolute binding affinities, not in our hands. Uh, it can't even really reliably rank order molecules. I mean, not even really. It can't reliably rank order molecules. But what it can do is, it, uh, in good favorable circumstances, is um, separate likely from unlikely molecules. And that's why when you evaluate a docking screen, a prospective docking screen, which you're making real predictions and testing them, uh, you know, you talk about, you know, what's your hit rate? How many of the molecules that you actually took the trouble to purchase and, and convince a, a kind collaborator to, to test or test in your own lab, how many of them worked? So this is our hit rate. And this is, this for GPCRs, as I'll show you in a second, this is sort of uh, 
the hit, the hit rate we've become accustomed to, uh, it, by historical standards, in, in our own lab, this is a very high hit rate. Um, the affinities weren't great, but we were able to progress them through more modeling and docking and ultimately um, a little bit of, of chemical synthesis directed by Ashish and, and prosecuted in, the, in Peter Geminer's lab to get to a molecule that ultimately had a, a Ki of one nanomolar and an, uh, an agonist EC50 of about four nanomolar. And, um, and this molecule has um, sort of miraculously played through, it, it's biased and it has these wonderful effects in, in in vivo, it doesn't confer respiratory depression. It's not <coughs> do, not much constipation, and it, it doesn't um, <coughs> induce lycine. So, so very different from opioids. So and this is one of the cases where structure led to novel chemistry, led to novel biology. That's the big idea. Um, we've done this for GPCRs. Turn out because they're well-formed binding sites, uh, because they're sequestered <coughs> from bulk solvent by and large. I'm guessing here, actually. And uh, because there's a lot of bias in the libraries towards GPCR-like ligands, um, docking has worked remarkably well for GPCR. So um, we've had hit rates uh, that are on the order of about 25%. So 25% of the molecules that pre predicted and actually tested work. And the affinities have been great in, and on multiple campaigns <coughs> now. And I'm just flying through these. these the last two are, are really interesting because these are our case. Uh, um, uh, Ryan uh, Strahan talked about these uh, this morning. Uh, the, these are, Kate, this is the probe for, uh, this is Ogren for uh, GPR68, and this is this unpublished work on another orphan, MRGPRX2. And they're interesting for technical reasons because they're, um, they're, they're homology models, they're orphans, there's, there's very little or no chemical matter known for these targets. It would depend on a close <laughs> back and forth between the theory and experimental results. Um, and, um, and this is another example where you get to new chemistry. It's by definition new because um, they're orphan receptors. Uh, and, and then the biology turns out to be really interesting and, and new too. And, and, and this, is, you know, this is where we are so lucky to collaborate with you know, real pharmacologists in, in with like Ryan in, in the Roth lab who are able to, to, to really take these compounds forward into animals and, and see what they do. And they do, it turns out they do interesting things. Okay, um, I want to tell you about some of the problems with docking. Um, we've been a we and many others have been able to make docking work in a pragmatic way, but um, we're still at the place in the field where we have to talk about hit rates. We can't predict affinities. We are, are sometimes our geometries aren't so great. Um, and um, here's some of the reasons why that's true and why there's a lot of room to improve the method. Uh, so what we're trying to calculate uh, is uh, a, a free energy of binding, uh, which is grossly speaking an interaction in it, free energy of interaction minus a solvation and a two different solvation terms. And, and it turns out that these terms are large in magnitude, uh, but the thing that you're getting to, you're subtracting you know, several large numbers from each other to get a small number. And so that's always going to be a challenge for accuracy. Um, to we get uh, the... the um, the interaction energy comes from uh, a, a discretized grid version of uh, London force dispersion repulsion uh, uh, terms and uh, electrostatic terms, and there's many approximations in making that, and, um, uh, and then uh, we calculate um, bulk desolvation energies, and, and, and uh, very recently also, also uh, are starting to employ um, um, uh, discrete solvation theory. Uh, inhomogeneous solvation theory from uh, in, uh, the, the Lazaridis method. Um, okay, uh, so um, the the problem, the thing is, is that we're we're stuck with this this bad situation where the the, the magnitudes are large and the 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 sum is small, and and so th this is like one of one of the docking hits for for um, the mu opioid receptor, and and here it is interacting with this. Uh, 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 anionic, this turns out to be an aspartate residue, and, and that's a good fit. But the, the docking will also return molecules that dock like this, and this is also a good fit. And it turns out the first one's right and the second one's wrong, but the differences between them can be small because uh, although this interaction is not as high in magnitude, an interaction between a, a, a carbonyl oxygen and a, and a positive a cationic nitrogen, it, it's just not as strong. But the, the desolvation penalty here, where you're more exposed to the bulk, 
is substantially less, both for the receptor and for the ligand. And so, you know, getting this balance right when these, when these magnitudes are, are high is, is, is hard. Um, so here's some of the problems we face. We have, uh, you know, we're docking 10 to the 7th diverse molecules. You, this number is actually growing very rapidly, the number of molecules we're docking. And we have to have charges and parameters for all of them. Uh, we have to calculate internal inter conformations that we sample. That we do very badly. Uh, we don't relax the system very well, so uh, we're going to get large errors because of that. Um, you know, uh, one of the papers Matt had us read uh, suggested that one of the reasons that uh, uh, n deep learning methods do as, as well as they do is, is because they can count on symmetry and they can count on proximity, uh, they, you know, no action at a distance. But, you know, those sorts of things fall apart with small molecules and ligand binding events because, you know, the solvent plays a huge role and it's often it's an implied role. It's, it's not a local role. Um, uh, water displacement. Um, so these are all things that we do horribly on. Uh, and there's huge inaccuracies, um, and, and these are these are some of the challenges in, in docking. Um, and then and then from for learning methods, um, I think one of the challenges, among the challenges, are, are, are is that that you know you can't rely on on hu having huge amounts of highly similar data, um, <coughs> as a problem as I see it. And and the space that you're sampling in terms of small molecules is very big, right? So there's uh, you know I think less than a hundred thousand crystal structures of, of small molecules uh, bound to proteins. Um, there's may, on the order, at least in the public domain, of a million affinities, right? Uh, uh, even taking that at face value, it's not very much. And, um, and, they, and they're, um, they run in series too, so it, it's not very diverse. And special bonus price, a lot of the data is really terrible. It, you can't trust, it's, it's not well measured even if it's correct. I mean, sometimes it is, uh, but sometimes it isn't, and, and a lot of it is artifactual. So I mean, some, it's, it's not even wrong. Um, uh, and then the, the the number of chemotypes that you're trying to sample is huge. You know, on, you know, eh, this is a number that's widely that was calculated once on an envelope and, and became true ever since, right? But but uh, uh, so, so people say, you know, the drug-like chemical space is 10 to the 62nd, but it. it it's a big, it's a huge space, right? And, and, and small differences in chemical structure can really matter. So, you know, if you move a methyl group around uh, a pyridine uh, ring, uh, you know, in terms of chemical properties, it won't matter very much. In, in, in the context of a larger molecule binding to a binding site, um, the, it, the methyl, you know, you can have a magical methyl that can have a huge or catastrophic effect. Often it doesn't, but sometimes it does. And if you put the methyl in the wrong place, it can really change the properties of the molecule <laughs> completely. Uh, and, and similar with, uh, you know, triazines and pyrimidines. I mean, these two molecules actually, despite the fact that one has an extra nitrogen, they're very similar in most contexts. But, um, you know, put the nitrogen next to each other and, and, and the properties change completely. So small difference, so lots of different ways of making a small molecule. That, that fits drug-like properties, and small differences can have huge effects. Um, nevertheless, in, in docking, you know, I think, uh, um, you know, I think one of the themes of this meeting is get to know an experimentalist, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, and and um, I, I think that's, um, it's not, um, it does, there's an investment. Right, uh, and uh, it's a worthwhile investment, but it's a it's a it's a deep investment, uh, and I, I you know highly encourage you to do it. Um, there's half steps. You can um, get to know people like us, right? And uh, we we don't do um, biological assays like of real bio targets, but we do have model systems in the lab. We're experimental model systems to to test docking, and. Um, you know, I think they're really good ways to go because they're experimentally very tractable. You get very high resolution information out of them and you can test lots of compounds. Um, uh, and so that's one way to, to put your toe in the water if you're not willing to jump into um, treating Ebola or, um, or, or targeting the GPCR -ohm just right yet. Um, the, the, um, an another problem that hasn't really been talked about much um, is this issue of like, okay, you've done your docking screen and, and maybe you use AutoDocVina, which is I, I think a terrific program, or, um, or, one, uh, uh, or Glide, or, um, or you collaborate with Atomwise, but which exact 
um, uh, uh, small molecules do you pick at the end of the day? Because the, the thing is, you know, when you're docking uh, eight, you know, 10 million compounds, or as you'll see, 100 or, or, or a billion compounds, um, that the, the list of really good scoring compounds that you basically can't tell apart um, is, is huge. It's er, even now, with in our hands, we're on the order of uh, 6 million molecules, it could be at least 10,000 molecules. And as we go to 100 million and a billion molecules, which we are doing, uh, it, it grows much larger. It, you know, that the very top ranking set, the 0.1% that, that all basically the same in terms of our ability to distinguish them, is, is now 100,000 molecules or more. And um, what we struggle with, we have these hit picking parties where we, you know, uh, so, uh, Abe was, it was, he's a good computer scientist, he, he, but you managed to, s to swallow the nausea when you said, like, can you imagine going through 2,500 compounds, right? But, but that's what we do, right? A and uh, it doesn't scale very well. And uh, actually, uh, Abe, you'll be pleased that, that Brian Kabilka has the exact same view that you do of, of that whole process. But that's what we do. And that's what uh, you know, people do on, on discovery teams. And, um, and we would love to have a method. We are skeptical about any such method because we think we know better. But we would love to have a method that would help us prioritize these, these hits, these very end stage but, but really um, artisanal methods that we use right now. And the last thing I want to say about docking is, um, is this other thing that's happening in the field that I'm not sure everyone has, has um, caught on to. And, and that is that the docking libraries Docking libraries of good molecules, physic, uh, physically well-behaved, uh, commercially available, get them to your bench in four weeks, molecules, has is doubled basically every two and I call this Irwin's Law. This is after John <laughs> Irwin, right? Uh, uh, and um, so when the first docking screen was done the f of a commercially available library looking for novel molecules in, in <coughs> 1991, there were 55,000 molecules that were docked. And uh, by the early 2000s, uh, it was you know, you know, about 300,000, and then close to a million, and and you know, and then three million, and now six million, and 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 then uh, and but what's happened is that vendors, especially uh, enamine, um, have told us, listen, guys, we will sell you 500,000 molecules that we have made, but there's a much wider space of molecules that we're very sure we can make through chemistry that we have under good control using building blocks that we have at least 10 grams of each. Um, and we think we can guarantee that we'll get you those molecules within four weeks if you order them, right? And, and there's uh, 148 million of those. And, and they're growing. And no one can screen. Somebody asked, why do docking? Why not just do screening? And, and there's, I think you should, there's always a reason to do screening, but there's increasingly a reason to docking, and, and that, that no, one can, no one can screen this. And, and you know, you think, well, what about DNA encoded libraries? And the th DNA encoded libraries are typically very narrow. They're, they're basically combi-chem around one or a small number of scaffolds for any particular library. But this is not. This is, very, this is a diverse library. Uh, whether it's a good library or not, we, we don't know yet. But we're we're, and we're struggling even to simulate it. But I think it's, um, we have some, uh, when you go, when you get to the scale, and, and, and uh, 148 million, uh, that's just the first step. I think in next year, it's going to be a billion. And you know, this is chemical space, right? It's, we can beat this Moore's Law thing any day. We just, <laughs> you know, we just have to stretch out our hands and try. And, and we are. And, um, and it's, in, in, we're, it's confronting us with great difficulties of, are we screening the right thing? Uh, are we going to just blow ourselves away with noise? Uh, can we handle? We, well, uh, this blows away the, UC the UCSF cluster is dead, but basically with this number of molecules, and we have a big cluster. Um, uh, so how how do we handle it? But I, I think in, in for s for many of these problems, um, some of the methods you guys are th considering could be helpful. Okay, I wanted to talk now about the thing I'm supposed to talk about, uh, which is chemoinformatics. How much time do I have? <coughs> Five minutes more. <laughs> uh, don't answer. Um, so, uh, uh, so, I w so, so the um, I told you about the um, central dogma of molecular pharmacology: start with a target, get small molecules. The way drug discovery was done for in its classic period for the first fifty years, when it was done on an industrial professional way, was exactly the opposite. You started with small molecules and tried to infer targets. 
And um, this man, uh, an American pharmacologist named Roger Alquist, uh, was one of the pr <coughs> practitioners of that. And uh, it was he who um, first s suggested that there might be two adrenaline receptors, the alpha and the beta adrenergic <coughs> receptor. And the reason why he thought that there might be is he looked at a series of six, it turns out, there's only three are shown, agonists of adrenaline, of the adrenaline circuit, and, and found that in most tissues, he was working with whole tissues and, some, and whole animals, and he found that in most tissues, you know, and this is like guinea pig ileum and cat nictating membrane, and it's like a charnel house of, of, of animal parts that he describes in his papers. Uh, uh, but in most of them, you know, noradrenaline was better than adrenaline, or was better than isoproteranol. But in a few of them, like uh, bronchial tissue or heart and some heart tissues, uh, it was isoproteranol was better. And, and based on that distinction, he inferred the existence of these receptor things. And this is, this is the time, this is like na late 1940s, people talked about the receptor theory of pharmacology. It's like nobody ever cloned or um, purified these receptors. They were just basically con useful conceptual structures to organize the structure activity relationships of small molecules acting on whole tissues or whole animals, right? And that was what pharmacology was all about. And anyways, uh, so he suggested there were two um, adrenaline receptors. And based on that paper, uh, uh, this man, uh, uh, Jim Black, here he's holding his Nobel Prize, for partly for this work, suggest went after this mythical creature called the beta adrenergic receptor and uh, and got propranolol, which was a franchise for beta blockers, so they blocked beta blockers. And then subsequently, people were able to get more specific molecules like atanolol that, you know, that inhibited something that based on it and its congeners' actions uh, inhibited this, antagonized this thing that they called the beta-1 adrenergic receptor, which they could distinguish because of different small molecules from the beta-2 adrenergic And that's how this typology came about. And, and, and it all, um, it was a very frustrating time. Many of, of the people who practiced this art um, hated it because they all believed that there were real, re real receptors, but they could never get to them. And, and uh, it, that was, I think, one of the seminal contributions in the mid-80s of Brian Kabilka and Bob Lefkowitz was to you know, clone and purify and isolate something called the beta-2 adrenergic receptor, which turned out to be a real thing. And, and then pharmacology changed, and, and we came upon the period we live in now. But um, that period of pharmacology was actually, in terms from a drug discovery standpoint, that way of viewing pharmacology from a small molecule standpoint was incredibly successful. Um, and uh, so what, you know, the, the chemoinformatic enterprise, uh, whether it knows it or not, sort of returns to that way of, of looking at pharmacology. And, and uh, instead of what we do now, which is say, oh, two receptors are similar if they look similar and, and by sequence and structure, uh, in the chemoinformatic view, uh, two receptors are similar if and only if they have similar small molecules. And their structure and sequence be damned. They can look completely different, but their, their small molecules look the same. We consider them similar, and that's, that's that chemoinformatic idea. And it really goes back to classical pharmacology. Um, so um, with the, the libraries that, that several people alluded to, uh, Ryan and, and, and Abe and others, um, uh, we, we can do this sort of at scale, and that's the great thing about chemoinformatics and computation is you, uh, the, uh, you know, you, you think of uh, Alquist and, and, and Black, they had 20 compounds and, you know, a few tissues, and, and we have, you know, a million small molecules. But I should just say, it's still a million, right? It's not a gajillion trillion like the number of cats on the internet. It's a million. Uh, and, um, and a lot of them aren't true, by the way, and 2,500 targets, right? Um, but still, uh, you know, from, from pharmacology, it sound, sound, still sounds like, you know, chemists, chemists don't, they don't, they're not like physicists. They don't throw around 10 to the 88th electrons in the visible universe type thing. You know, like a million molecules sounds like a lot, man. And okay, so that's, that's a big domain that you can work on. And, and so, um, what, you know, what we've done is, you know, interrogating basically Kemble uh, has been our go-to library because it's, it's really high quality and, um, um, and it's completely open source. And so we've interrogated it to predict new targets for establishing a drug repurposing. And this is a project we did with um, 
um, Eugen Lundkine and uh, uh, Laszlo Urban at Novartis, where we took about half of the approved FDA approved drugs. There's shockingly few FDA approved drugs, right? People, not everybody realizes, like 1,500 FDA approved drugs. It's not that many. Anyways, they took about half of the small molecule approved drugs and um, asked us to say, predict what their tox targets might be. And they had a, this panel of, you know, less than 100 uh, tox targets. And, and we were tasked with predicting which of the 656 drugs would hit which of the targets. And uh, that we did through, through Mike Kaiser, the method that Mike Kaiser developed. Uh, when he was a graduate student, which is a similarity ensemble approach. I won't take you with, through it. it. It basically applies, um, it, is, uh, it basically takes the BLAST method and applies it to chemoinformatics. That's the, the key insight and corrects for um, background distributions so you don't get confused by, by the sort of run-of-the-mill similarity that you inevitably see in small molecules and small molecule sets. And, and this worked out really well, uh, you know, basically uh, they tested, uh, you know, over uh, a thousand predictions, real predictions, uh, and about half of them worked, with working being anywhere from less than 30 micromolar to sometimes down into the nanomolar range. And, and even, you know, 30 micromolar doesn't sound like great, but for, you know, an off-panel tox uh, assay, it was enough to, I mean, they chose these cutoffs, not us. Um, and and ab uh, about half were, were false. Uh, false positives in our method. So we predicted them. They t went to the red guys, went to the trouble of testing them, and they didn't work. Uh, but half worked. And so for us, you know, you know, from a docking standpoint, you know, trained in docking, this seemed great. Um, and uh, uh, it, uh, why is it stuck? Um, Okay, um, and um, just to show you a few of the, so here this just leads me into the last part of the talk, which is that I think the most inter for us, you know, they were interested in for all for for sometimes for different reasons than we were. One of the things that that really interested us was that uh, about 26 percent of the uh, confirmed the predictions that were experimentally tested and shown to be correct uh, crossed major domain boundaries. So this is an example. This is allocitrin. It's a, um, a serotonin uh, 3 ion channel antagonist. It's a drug. Um, and um, uh, it was predicted to uh, hit uh, serotonin 2b. Uh, and you may think, well, why is that so, what's so cool about that? They're both serotonin receptors. And, but this is an ion channel and this is a G-protein coupled receptor. Though they, evolutionarily, they spawned in different C's. They're, they're uh, Seek, there's no substantial sequence, there's no sequence similarity. That's what this, this is a sequence blast score, so it's, there's no sequence similarity. The structures are very different, you know. There's not, got nothing to do with one another, except they happen to be called serotonin receptors, and, you know, thereby hangs a tail, and that's what I'm going to come to. But, you know, this is, this is an example of crossing a major target boundary. Nevertheless, the, the e, the, the per, we were confident in the prediction based on the similarity of the ligands known to bind there. Uh, and uh, this, so, and this is another example. Uh, 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 this uh, chlorotriazine we actually took in uh, in, in vivo um, to to see if it was relevant and turned up. But but what the only emphasis I'll make here is that it was known to hit the estrogen receptor. There's a drug known to hit the estrogen receptor. Was predicted to hit COX-1. That turned out to be true, even though they have no structural or sequence similarity. And so these are surprising predictions, right? So that that's uh, you know. That's what turned us on. The, um, the thing we started to think about, I have to finish? Okay, uh, uh, how much time do I have? N no, t n no time? Okay, uh, well let me just get to the punchline. The, um, the thing that we, we started to wonder is, you know, why is this true? And uh, uh, um, that uh, so often that when you do, when you organize small molecules, by chemical similarity, uh, that the <coughs> targets that you'll bring together are unrelated by sequence and structure, um, and and um, so this this was we did this on a whole class on a whole family of the GPCRs when we were able to make predictions, and I won't take you through them. Um, uh, what, what we eventually the thought we came to: uh, Why is it true? Th these are this is the GPCR tree. Uh, organized by ligand similarity and the, these, this penumbra of other targets 
uh, are non-GPCRs that are strikingly similar by, by the ligands that they bind. They, there's no sequence similarity. They're all different families. Nuclear hormone receptors, kinases, ion channels, no similarity to GPCRs. Uh, but their ligands all look similar. And um, what, what we realized is that um, signaling molecules do the same thing, right? So signaling molecules like serotonin, for instance, uh, binds to ion channels, that's serotonin-3 is an ion channel, and to G-protein coupled receptors. And, um, and it's not only true for um, uh, serotonin, but it's true for many of the known, certainly small molecule signaling uh, neurotransmitters. And uh, the, probably the reason why it's true is that um, uh, signaling molecules, especially organic chemistry molecules like serotonin, dopamine, ATP, are hard to make. They're, they're not encoded genetically. The proteins that make them and degrade them and control them are encoded genetically, but the small molecules are not encoded genetically. And um, so, so they're typically very ancient molecules that have evolved once, gotten trapped by the multiple control points that are necessary to use them biologically, and then have become basically impossible to change. The receptors, on the other hand, are very plastic. Uh, you can evolve, recruit and evolve a known ion channel to recognize serotonin. It's almost impossible to change serotonin without breaking a bunch of other things that you're not willing to break if you're the cell. Um, and so um, I think, you know, one of the ideas I've learned recently ab about, um, you know, why, why should neural networks, so it turns out we, we, were, we were motivated by the idea of, you know, why is this chemoinformatic stuff that goes completely opposite to the last 40 years of pharmacology, why should it work? It, it's not based on physics and evolution the way and structure the way structure-based discovery is, or, or high-throughput screening is, or molecular pharmacology is. It, um, so why should it work as well as it does? Because it does work. And it, and it resonated, the way I'm, reason I'm ending with this is that what, you know, the, some of the papers that Matt suggested, the same idea came out in why should neural networks work, and, and the, the idea there is because they're capturing deep physical laws. The deep chemoevolutionary evolution law that I think we're exploiting in chemoinformatics, especially for off-target prediction, is, is that the signaling molecules have the same ability to cross, not only ability, necessity of crossing major target boundaries to, to integrate um, pharmacological, res the pharmacological responses that they want to induce across time domains. And so the idea I'll, I'll end with is that in, in pharmacology, uh, the receptors have evolved around the small molecules. And that's what we're exploiting in chemoinformatics. Thank you very much. Have time for a few questions. So one of the predictions, predictions of the model would be that if you take these different sequences, they might not have very high sequence similarity, but their binding sites would have high sequence similarity because they're all designed to sort of capture this small molecule. Does that turn out to be the case when you're comparing, for example, that kinase with GPCR or something like that? It's sometimes true, but it's, it's the exception and not the rule. And, and the reason for that is, the, the, if you think about, there is no code, basically, for small molecule recognition. And, and this the slide that I, I skipped over, it's meant to illustrate that. There's, there's multiple ways to recognize a phosphate, right? If you say, if I was to ask you, how would, if you were a protein, how would you recognize a phosphate? And thinking quickly, you'd probably say, oh, an arginine and a lysine or something like that. But you can also do it with a, with a, a protein backbone. Uh, you know, these, these P loops of proteins are just amides organized. So that's a completely different way. And, and same thing for basically every functional group that you can think of. And, and so it's n even the binding sites can look very different and still bind exactly the same uh, transmitter. Yeah. Yeah, the, so the question is, uh, what, what happens if you blur your eyes and don't represent it at the uh, amino acid level, like it's a serine, but say, can it hydrogen bond or is it greasy or, right? What are the physical properties? Yeah, people have tried that. Um, and th some people quite systematically, um, like uh, Ruben Abadjian has a paper, 
either out or coming out in um, Nature Chemical Biology comparing binding sites for looking at off targets and um, uh, 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 David Glorium, something similar in, in, in Denmark. Um, it doesn't scale a, as easily and I'm not, I'm not sure how far it's gone in terms of, they're usually looking within the same, they're looking at GPC, comparing one GPCR to another, they haven't gone GPCR to ion channel. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it might be possible. The laws of physics and physical chemistry still hold, right? So it, if you do it the right way, you can do it. I'm not sure we've struck on the, quite the right way yet. We have time for one more question. Do you think, uh, on that note, and in the context of kind of this workshop, do you think that it's possible to use some of this uh, deep learning to maybe find a new way to represent quantum mechanics, which would, you know, you say the physical laws are the physical laws. So maybe there's a way to kind of bridge these two to make that more tractable in terms of computational time? Yeah, I, I actually am most optimistic from, you know, what little I know, uh, that the, the deep learning methods will play out in the chemoinformatics. Uh, because there are patterns. I mean, it's a basically a pattern recognition method. And the, let's, you know, uh, the, the fingerprints we use are, they're pretty primitive, right? And so surely we can do better. I would add, I mean, there's ongoing work by our, our lab and many other labs to do just that, to predict quantum mechanics directly from uh, using the Yeah, because most of the, you know, the 2D representations that we look at, or even the 3D representations that we look at, are already that abstraction. And to go back to the electronic <coughs> structure is really the foundation. Okay, let's think right again.